Boston College lands two transfers in, at the wide receiver position this offseason. Is this the deepest group Boston College has ever had at that position? You are Locked On Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Locked On Boston College. I'm your host, AJ Black. This episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. So <clears throat> we're now a week into practice in Chestnut Hill. BC has been in the Fishfield House. They're getting things ready uh, for the Jay McGillis Spring Game, which is April 13th at noon and I've been watching i've been into a couple practices already and i got a chance to kind of get the vibe of this team and one thing that is sticking out to me right now is the talent in this wide receiver room now going over the of the last two years with the eagles you've seen bc do some things that they haven't done historically with this program now bc's had you know they've had some good wide receivers in their past right uh, Richie Cannell, Alex Amadon, you go back, you know, Brian Brennan, there's, you go back, you know, there's guys in the, in the history of this program, Gerald Phelan, but it's always been like one guy or a couple guys here. And I watched this wide receiver room this year, and it's different than the years with Zay Flowers. Zay Flowers is a, probably going to be the most talented wide receiver Boston College has ever had. And I don't think there's going to be anyone coming up soon that will be able to challenge him because he's a first round draft pick. You know, he had a good season um, and does things that you just don't expect out of a BC wide receiver. But that's not the what I'm noticing here. What I'm noticing about this wide receiver room is that it's deep and it's talented. It doesn't it may not. And I'm not going to say I'm going to preface this. It may not have the top end talent like Zay Flowers, like elite first round talent but man is it got a lot built into this group let's start with what you have what you've already had on this program and that would be lewis bond <clears throat> lewis bond spoke to the media on tuesday and that was answered a, a funny question where he was asked what it's like to have uh hitting and tackling this early in camp and he joked and said I don't know. I haven't been hit yet. That's been the kind of camp it's been for him. Uh, he's a great Lewis Bond. I've said all along, you know, he had that strong start to that season last year. And really, I think has a good connection with Thomas Castellanos that I, I, I expect him to, to break out that once Castellanos is able to get that passing game more consistent, like we saw at the beginning of the year, that Bond is going to be a guy that does what we saw him do quite a bit, which is cause issues with tackling, cause, break tackles, things like that. He's He's got a lot of that going for him. I like that with him. And then you go past him. You get Dino Tomlin. He's solid. I'm not going to say he's anything that BC has never had before. Staffs always like him. I don't think of him as anything special, but he's got some, he's someone that has been around the name. I go back to that. I I'm waiting to also see what he can do this year is Jaden Skeet. Jaden Skeet is now a, I believe he's a sophomore. I don't think he, I don't think he had a red shirt last year, but he's a local kid, Catholic Memorial high school, Massachusetts, a uh, good size, but really good uh, agility watching him practice. And watching him with Castellanos, he's been a guy that's been with the first team during spring practice. It's a guy that they've been throwing out there. Not Tomlin. It's been it's been Jaden Skeet. Remember, Jeff Halfley loved him. If he he thought he was a special player that was going to start right off the bat, he didn't. But he did play quite a bit near the end and made some good plays. I like what he can do. I think he's going to be a very valuable wide receiver and be a starter for this team. And then the third wide receiver. Uh, that's coming back is 
I'm already blanking. Why am I? <laughs> so those are those are the three big names that you got. The, oh, the third one that everyone's still wondering about is Joseph Griffin. Now, the staff has not talked about Joseph Griffin yet <clears throat> because he hasn't been at practice. He, I, I, I can tell you, folks, I have not seen him there. I could also say that they kind of hide at practice the uh, injured players in the weight room. A lot of times they're over their weight room and we are on the opposite end and we're not allowed to go on the other side. So you could be in there. I just don't see him. Remember, he missed the end of last year. He missed the bowl game and due to an undisclosed injury. So we don't know what's going on with him. I don't know how injured he is, but he hasn't been out there. But, you know, I thought last year was kind of disappointing. I was expecting more from Griffin, uh, but he is a big wide receiver. He's a four star. You're waiting to have him have a big year. Um, and I'm not sure what role he's going to play, but he, again, adds that depth piece to that, right? Then you have all of these younger wide receivers that um, Halfley last year really thought highly of. You had Reed Harris, who is built like a tight end. He's like 6'4". He's enormous. You have Nate Johnson, who's supposed to be pretty quick. I've seen him out there with the second team. Uh, both of these guys were, were second teamers. You have Montrell Wade. Uh, so you've got a couple other freshmen that are, are redshirt freshmen that are waiting to get their playing time too. But then you add in the two new ingredients to this group, and that is Jaden McGowan out of Vanderbilt, and you add uh, Jerron Bradley out of Texas Tech. Now, this is the second episode this uh, this week that you've heard me talk about Jerron Bradley. I'm telling you, by the time BC plays Florida State in September, you're going to get sick of hearing me talk about Jerron Bradley. But I'm doing it on purpose because I'm telling you, this guy's going to be something special. But Jane, let's start with Jaden McGowan. Jaden McGowan is one of the fastest. He, he's got speed. And I look at him, and what I see is a guy that could play the role Ryan O'Keefe played last year. You know, a lot of the shorter stuff, that they're going to let him use his legs and try to get going. I'm not sure if he's going to start. Uh, it's interesting. That's going to be something that we'll watch during practice because right now, the starters that go with with Castellanos has consistently been Bond, Skeet, and Bradley every time. So I'm not sure what McGowan will do. He's going to be definitely involved in special teams, uh, seeing him a lot with punt and kick returns. But will he play a bigger role? But again, that goes back to the depth of this team. This, this, there's a lot of wide receivers that are there that could play right now. And that's good. That's what I'm talking about here. They're built to have a passing offense. I think that's exciting. And then we go back to Jerron Bradley. Jerron Bradley, 6'5". And I said his wingspan is huge. And he's going to do a lot for this offense. Um, he's going to be a, a guy that you can throw in the red zone because obviously if he can get up there and get it, he's going to be that guy. He's a guy that's got good, you know, he's going to be a, a reception wide receiver, like a guy who's get the ball and let him do his thing. He's going to do a lot. And it makes me wonder, like, if he's got, he's the guy that Joe Griffin should have been. We, I mean, I'm not sure what Joe Griffin's role is going to be this year. But what I do see is a group that is built for to really resurrect the Boston College passing offense. And unlike years like 2022, when you had Zay Flowers and then a bunch of question marks, this group is deep. And it's it's a it's a war chest for Bill O'Brien to figure out how to get this passing offense going at the level that it did against Louisville, that it did against Florida State last year. There's a lot of talent in there, guys. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen there. Now, in a moment, I want to talk about the newcomers to this team because Bill O'Brien made a quick comment about them, but I kind of want to give you kind of my thoughts after watching some of them, where where they're going to be, you know, what their role looks like right now as BC continues to go through the 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 early stages of spring practice and gets things going for that 2024 season. We'll get into that in just a moment. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of us, the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The Oregon Ducks are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in the final Pac-12 tournament. 
Can't believe the tournaments. That's it. Poor, poor Oregon State and Washington State. But Oregon, they're going to be heading out to the Big Ten. And they're going to do it after punching their ticket to the big dance. They say win life, go rogue. And that's exactly what the Ducks have done here. So take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada, and go get your next big adventure. Shop Nissan USA today. FanDuel knows that your bracket's going to be, could be very, very um busted and i'm telling you folks when i play against my friends i i know every year that i'm going to make some stupid mistake that i'm going to regret in a couple weeks but you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed it's time to go dancing on america's number one sports book because right now new customers get 200 dollars in bonus bets if your first five dollar bet wins that's 200 bucks to use up point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. You're going to pick UConn? Boo. Well, that's who I picked. But, you know, maybe that's a good sign. I'm, I'm the guy that never gets it right. So maybe it'll be Houston. Maybe it'll be Tennessee. Who knows? Maybe a, a team out of left field is going to win it. But you can just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college basketball until they cut the down the nets. This is Locked On Boston College, AJ Black. Hope you guys are all doing well. We are talking about spring football practice. It's exciting. It's been very, very exciting this whole week with Bill O'Brien back in. As I said, practices have been packed with visitors. We have another one this Saturday, and I'll be there for that practice. I think you're going to probably see some really interesting names. Recruiting is hitting, hitting high right now. Uh, there's been some new official visitors that have been named, but... Going into the season, there's still the transfer portal. And as I've said on this podcast, I don't think Boston College is done in the transfer portal, both in and out. I think there's going to be some players that um, probably exit after the season, after the spring. Maybe they don't see um, their role, what they like. Uh, and Bill O'Brien already says he's going to have an exit interview with every player so they know what their role is on the depth chart. There'll be no surprises for these guys. They're going to know. And that, that's a good thing. I think he's being transparent is a great thing, but it also gives you the risk that you're going to have maybe a few guys that, I don't know, maybe Halfley wasn't as upfront with them. I'm not sure what he did. He wasn't, he never talked about it with us, but maybe this is going to make it much more clear to certain people like, Hey, there's no role in me in this team. I'm going to enter the portal, but that also gives Bill O'Brien the ability to go and grab some more players. And as I've said, there's a few positions, offensive line, uh, linebacker, yeah, the, uh, the secondary that I still think that they should be looking at. And there's one player in the transfer portal that BC had got a commitment from that I'm not even sure is going to ever end up on campus. And that's Cam Martinez, safety from Ohio State. Remember, this was a kid, uh, I think he was a four-star, has not really played all that much for Ohio State. And he played at Ohio State after he got recruited there by Jeff Halfley. So he came over here because of his relationship with Jeff Halfley. And now Halfley's gone. Most of the entire defense is gone. And I have to say, I've asked BC about it. I usually drive them crazy. And usually they tell me like, yeah, nothing's changed. But I noticed just a couple days ago that Cam Martinez wiped all BC mentions from his bio. His commitment post is still up there, but I'm not sure what's going on. I honestly don't know. And I'm just going to throw that out there right now. But there's a bunch of other guys that I've been watching at camp. And we've talked about Bradley. Bradley, uh, I've been very, very impressed. This guy is the tallest guy in the line in the huddle that's not a um a tackle. And he's built. He's not a lean guy. He's built with muscle. I mean he's lean muscle, but he's he's got he's got he's built like a guy that can shed some tackles. He's gonna be a nightmare. We've talked about this already. So, and there's other transfers that have been playing too. And I, I, I you know, I, this is a good chance to kind of review where they're at. Grayson James from Florida International is going to be the backup quarterback. I'm already calling that right now. Unless things change with Jacoby Robinson, who's now a redshirt freshman, James looks very much like the second best quarterback on that roster. Robinson's still pick, figuring things out. And I, and I, and there's a chance he could figure things out this summer, man. You, you know, He's he's picking things up. He looks a lot better than he did last year. He just doesn't look ready yet. 
So I, I'm I'm excited to see what Grayson James can do. Hopefully they don't need to. That, that's the best part with this group. You hope that Thomas Castellanos can play all 13 plus games next year. Yeah, I'm saying 13 because they're going to make a bowl game, right? Hopefully they won't need Grayson James. But he's there if you need him. So you got him. Then you've got a pair of running backs that are in the room now. You have Jordan McDonald and Treshawn Ward. B, remember, BC basically nuked their running back room minus Kai Robichaux and Dontrell Jones. There were three guys, I think it was, that left. And they're all Jeff Hathley and Frank Signetti's uh, first year of um, first couple of years of running backs where they were just getting like five, eight guys <laughs> that were just like not built for ACC football. You lost Cam Barfield, Xavier Coleman and Andre Hines. So and Andre Hines is not that, but he he left. To, I think he's at like Wagner or something like that. Right. So you brought in Treshawn Ward. He's going to be a, a valuable player in multiple aspects on this team. He's already working with special teams. I saw him on punt returns, kick returns. He's doing a little bit of that. He's also going to basically be 1A to 1B, you know, Batman to Robin with Kai Robichaux. Uh, right now, at least what I've seen. He's good. The scrimmage I watched, he scored the, the one, I think it was the one touchdown in that game. Uh, he looks good. He, he's a good size. He's not undersized at all. He can catch the pelt ball in the flat. You know, he gets, he, he can be a, uh, a, a receiving running back. That's a good thing. So he's got that going. Jordan McDonald is a moose. He is, he, uh, Kai Robichaux is big. Jordan McDonald's is enormous. <laughs> I, I think I put it up on either Eagle Insider or, or on Twitter. I, I was standing right next to the, the running backs at a practice. And Jordan McDonald is, he almost looks like, you ever see the picture of Derrick Henry next to Mark Ingram? And Derrick Henry looks like an alien because he's like absolutely enormous. And Mark Ingram's a big guy too. It's not that exaggerated, but he, he built, wide and taller than everyone else on that running back room. Um, and so he's going to, I'm not sure what he'll do. Uh, maybe he's a, a goal line back because he's going to be a, a handful to try to tackle. Or maybe he's a short guy, a short down back. I, I, you could find something for him to do. I'm just curious how they're going to utilize him, but he's there. Kamari Morales will be uh, one of your starting tight ends. Um, big dude do like a lot of these guys are, he's been in college forever. So he's built for college. Like he's been around. Um, and he looks like he's been connecting well with Thomas Castellanos, right? Like he's been out there with the first teams, but you know, but you know, sometimes they put in him and Jeremiah Franklin, uh, but he's going to be your most reliable pass, <coughs> pass catching tight end. I think nothing, nothing, um, I saw Trevor Haas from the Glo uh, globe put down that he's going to be like the biggest tight um one of the biggest acquisitions that they got in the transport i don't i don't think so not not trashing what haas has to say i just don't think of morales as like super like dynamic like he's gonna be good but he's not like a game changing he's not gonna be hunter along and that's okay you just need a solid tight end that can stay healthy and do what you need to do right he can do that i just don't think he's gonna be um otherworldly like bradley could be we talked about mcgowan that gives you your your offense, right? Go to the defensive side of the ball. Um, Sed McConnell is a defensive lineman from Illinois. And I just gotta say, I saw him get chewed out by, by Bill O'Brien in the in the scrimmage. I don't know what happened, but he threw him to the not not threw him, but like benched him basically for something that happened. And it sounded like maybe he wasn't doing something he was supposed to be doing technique wise, I'm guessing. But he got benched. Ryan Turner's been out there with the first teams. He looks like I think he's going to be probably like the slot corner or, or nickel corner. He, he'll be out there uh, with Bryce Crease Brown, who's going to be the other um, defensive back that we'll see a lot of, too. Um, I I think your defensive back starters will be some combination of Amari Jackson, Bryce Crease Brown, Ryan Turner, and Jalen Cheek. You know, you, get, you need a lot of de defensive backs out there. You play a lot of nickel. That's going to be mostly what your base is. Um, a lot of those guys are going to be out there, uh, and that gives you all of your transfers, right? You've had you have um, no one on the offensive line. You, uh, there's only no other edges, but I think that's a pretty good group, and they're very active. And Bill O'Brien said he did he would not say names, but he said that they've done an excellent job of integrating with the current roster, and they're doing a good job at practice. So that kind of wraps up what we are, where we're at with that group. And as I said, I don't think they're done. 
I think there'll be more transfers coming in and going out. And we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there was not, I mean, very minimal when it, when uh, Jeff Halfley left. And now we're outside of that window. So we're going to have to wait. And I think the, the portal opens on the 15th again. Um, but stay tuned, Eagle Insider. We'll have a lot of updates there if, it, if when it happens. Now, in a moment, and the ACC is in trouble again as Clemson joins the, uh, predictably joins um, the Florida State Party and trying to get the heck out of this conference. We'll talk about where they're at and everything going on in between there. Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire Stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Let's give you a quick little thing. I use my Fire TV for a ton of stuff. I watch my cable on there. I have my Netflix. I got all the apps for all the downloadable you know movies that I want. But I've been starting to do yoga. Um, I do. Uh, uh, DDP yoga and I wanted to mirror it off my phone and I was able to do that off my fire TV. So it was like right there. It was perfect. It was so easy to use because you can get the app to mirror things on your fire TV. So you can do it too. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On. You could have a constant supply of AJ Black in your room right now, 24 hours a day, listening to me talk about Boston College sports nonstop. I know you want it. You can get that, and you can, I guess, you can mix in big pro leagues and college conferences as well as you want. But you should be checking out Locked On BC. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and more. Check out Fire TVs on Fire TV and Alexa devices. Check out my channel on there. And if you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you definitely should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire tv this is locked on boston college aj black here now time for me to rant a little bit here because we now have the second acc school that is now suing the conference and the second acc school that is also getting sued by that said conference and that is the school of clemson Clemson filed a lawsuit in South Carolina um, on Tuesday describing all the exorbitant fees that they'd have to pay and how unfair it would be um, based off of other uh, conferences that don't have exit fees that are um, as high. And they, they mentioned the SEC and the Big Ten and how it's like $50 million for one and there's no fee for another or whatever it is, right? And they're showing that that's bad, uh, not fair practice. And as I said with Florida State, and I will say it again, I don't, I, 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 I hear where they're coming from in one sense. You can complain because you want to be with the big boys. But I also say you sign the darn contract yourself. Every team in the ACC signed that grant of rights deal. And you signed it for the for the for the duration that you thought was good. And you every school here thought that the grant of rights when it was signed like three or four years ago was going to be a solid deal for the ACC. Now, all these schools are using revisionist history to try to get out of that deal so they can go get that money that SEC and Big Ten programs are getting. The ACC is countersuing Clemson for damages which I think is utterly hilarious. Maybe Clemson can pay them back with that slide that they have in their football facility or the miniature golf thing that they have, a movie theater or whatever else that they've used to, to buy because it's necessary for a football program to have a, a, um, a slide. Maybe they could do that. No, I don't care. This is all posturing. Clemson has not even said that they want to get out of the conference. They just want to explore. Well, they want to get out of the conference. They all do. All, these schools all are thinking about that. What's interesting, too, is around the same time that this Clemson news came out was a article, and I think it was in Tampa, 
that talked about this. They fought, starting to to unveil the schools that were advocating the ACC to sue Florida State when that first happened. And listed right on that group was Boston College. BC was pushing the ACC to sue them back, um, which is it, which is hilarious. And if you're new to the show and you you somehow found me by searching Clemson or Florida State, don't respond to me with "Oh, you're a Boston College fan," <laughs> you know all that stuff. Um, Boston College is a little, you know what? I'm talking from a perspective of college football. I think the uh, consolation, the um, the shrinking of valuable conferences is not a good thing that they're consolidating these to two is bad. Just like I heard uh, Greg Sankey saying that he wants to basically kick out the smaller conferences out of the NCAA tournament. All of this stuff that, that that's catering to these big programs is terrible. It's capitalism at its best. Yeah. You're making a lot of money, but is it making the product any better? I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have a couple big, big schools that are are dominating things, but like, what's the end goal of all of this? Is it just to have a minor league football se- series, you know, of teams? I'm not sure. And where does this leave Boston College? Clemson may leave, Florida State may leave, but Bud Elliott said it best. Someone asked him about that, and he didn't ask about BC, but he asked about Pitt, who I think is kind of a similar school. And he says, if all this stuff changes, nothing is going to change for Pitt. Pitt has never been a school that has battled for national championships. And you could say the same thing for Boston College. There's some of us out, some of you out there that are like, oh, BC should be a, a national contender. But he's right. Like, you you look at the recruiting changes that are going on in some of these schools. Like, like the difference is where BC's at compared to to Texas or Alabama. They, they're they're in a different ball game. So I go back to what I said before. Yes, the ACC may be in trouble, but I think it, once the dust settles, BC will be in a in a situation that's similar to what they're in right now. Maybe without Florida State or Clemson or Miami for that matter. Maybe there'll be a few other teams that'll be gone as well. But that's fine. BC will still have a chance to get to the playoffs. BC will be in a conference where they can play teams that are interesting and better than UConn or UMass. They're not going to get left behind to go into the Patriot League. I I hope the folks that say that all the time aren't serious, but I don't know. I I think they're joking. I hope they're joking. But they're not going to get left behind in the Patriot League. But there's going to be a lot of schools that are in the similar situation to BC. And there's going to be schools that are in similar situations to BC that think right now that they're in a better situation in the big 10 or the sec that when all this money starts to come in and they're looking at a school like Vanderbilt or a school like Rutgers or Maryland or Illinois, they're going to say, ah, these schools don't deserve that kind of money and things are going to change again. So yes, it's worrisome on the unease of the unknown is always anxiety producing. But folks, I think it's going to be all fine. Let the big boys, you know, uh, kick, try to kick the door down to get to the SEC or Big Ten. There'll be a few of them. Things are going to be okay. Just take a big deep breath. Let them do their thing. We'll be fine. Boston College football in ten years will still be Boston College football. We'll still be, in, you know, looking at eight or nine wins as a great season. That's kind of depressing. But anyways. That's where my thoughts were on that. Clemson, good luck. Um, if it's any better, it, I haven't read their lawsuit, but if it's at least if it has correct spelling, it's a, a immediate improvement over Florida State's, which was littered with spelling errors and all sorts of grammatical issues. But that's for neither here for there. Now tomorrow we're going to be back, and I have a special guest. We're going to have BC hockey blogger back on. We had him on a couple times, but he's going to get ready for the hockey East semis against UMass. We'll have him on to talk, and on Monday. We're going to have Mitch Wolf on to talk about Pro Day and the results that came up from that. You're going to want to hear that as we get ready for the NFL draft. This is AJ Black. Thank you all so much for listening. You can follow me on Twitter at AJBlack247 and Lockdown BC. Check me out at Eagle Insider. Hit that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts right now. 
because we're locked on Boston College. We're the only daily Boston College podcast out there, and I hope you enjoyed it because this is Locked On Boston College, your team every day.